Okay, Boker Tov, or as I say, Tzoraim Tovim, we can start. I um, have the, the honor of broadcasting from Yerushalayim, where uh, I've been spending the last, I guess I, I got here Monday night, and um, uh, a three-day solidarity mission, which is basically, the, that's who comes to Israel these days. Um, these missions, uh, they basically all follow the same, more or less, you know, they go, they spend a, a day in Jerusalem, a day in the Gaza envelope, like where we were as in Kvaraza on Wednesday and Shteirot, and it's a lot to talk about, but I don't, that's not the time, I don't think. And uh, they in Tel Aviv, and it's, uh, let's say, it's very powerful. Uh, the people in Israel are really amazing and really strong. I think there there is, you know, everything you read about, the sense of unity and uh, people, basically, it's the, the Golden Mayor line. We have no choice. If Israel doesn't win this war decisively, there will be no state of Israel. That's sort of the feeling. In other words, they will not be able to live here if, if Hamas is still in power uh, when this ends. And um, the determination is amazing, but what's even more amazing is the confidence of the people. And uh, it's uh, it's tough, but uh, what can I say? I mean, I, I'm America, Canada, you know. But anyways, uh, we met a lot of fascinating people and whatever, parents who lost, you know, children and uh and uh, people who who say people and uh, are, you know an analyst and and the president we had a meeting with President Herzog and uh, very uh, honored and whatever okay I'm happy to talk about it another time but let's uh, get into our learning and uh, listen I will say if you can come it's worthwhile coming I mean our cab driver this morning thanked us for giving him Parnassa for his day because uh, they know you know half the restaurants are closed and there's nobody you know. Uh, people aren't here and so uh business and the hundreds of thousands of people in the army they're slowly releasing some it uh really has an impact on the economy so just for the economic uh benefits i don't know how much money i'm spending but you know a little bit a, a, a little bit all of us add to the economy okay um because we're giving the sheer an hour early i decided it's not really fair to go on the sitter so we'll take a break and for those who remember uh 10 point bonus uh in uh for we did part one of the 613 meets one when i was in portugal in the summer so does anybody remember what we spoke about was anybody there i can just you know give the same share would anybody notice you probably would notice but though okay so i'll very briefly i think this is uh the topic of the 613 meets what is a fascinating topic so very i'll give like a, a very brief review of what we discussed the back in june and that's basically that uh, there's, A, there's no consensus about what the 613 meets what are. There is no list that people agree upon. There are lists, but uh, the lists vary. The the Bahag's list, that's the first one, the 8th century, the first list. And that list includes Megillah Esther and the Tilat Yadai, which are a rabbinic mitzvot. It's very strange, included in the 600. And we assume the 613 mitzvot are, are biblical. Nonetheless, he includes you know, seven rabbinic mitzvot. The Rambam didn't like that too much, and that's a huge understatement. And uh, he wrote his list, and uh, the the problem is that there are five million mitzvot. What do you mean, 613 mitzvot? There, there's a, a million things we have to do. So uh, so he had he gave you 14 limiting categories. That uh, The most important limiting category, that anything that is not directly in the text is not a mitzvah. In other words, 98% of Judaism uh, is not considered one of the Taryag mitzvot. In other words, to keep Shabbos. Okay, so there's a mitzvah to keep Shabbos. How to keep Shabbos, that's not in the Torah anywhere. The 39 um, categories of work are nowhere to be found in the Torah. So none of those are considered biblical mitzvot. Um, mm -hmm. Most of what we do in Jewish life is not written in the Torah. It's one of the, the 13, uh, that's the most, most famous one, the 13 principles of Rabbi Yishmael. And the Kavach Homer, Xerashav, exactly by reading between the lines of the text is very nice. And maybe that's more important. You read between the lines of Shakespeare, too. <laughs> and it's not that the, but it's not a biblical mitzvah. It's not one of the Taryag mitzvah. It, and actually, I should rephrase that. It may be a biblical mitzvah, but it doesn't count as one of the 613 mitzvot. And then I discussed who cares? Like, what's the difference? If we assume there are 39 biblical prohibited activities on Shabbos, and theoretically, one gets a death penalty if one cooks 
on Shabbos. Uh, doesn't say anywhere in the Torah you can't cook on Shabbos. So, so it is a biblical mitzvah. So who cares if it's one of the six hundred three mitzvahs? So I explained that though I've asked this question to many people, and everybody if they never thought of that question. It's an interesting question. So I have an answer. I, I then tell them my answer. Oh, well, that's an interesting answer. Whether it's right or not is different story, but I, I assume it is right. Um, that um, because it's based on it's not uh, just I made it up, it's based on things on sources that um basically um any drasha can change um that there are 39 malachot that was made by the rabbis at a certain period in history they decided or they declared what are the malachot and there are debates about all these things and uh, most of the drashot we have there are debates and uh, we may accept a certain uh halachic type of position but that can change. Um, now, the problem is, and the reason we find this strange, because we today can't change it for the last 1,800 years, uh, may, let's say from the time of the Mishnah. Uh, that's a, that's other question, maybe from the time of the Gemara. Uh, at some point, in the, at least 1,500 years ago, we no longer have the ability to undo and to change a drasha and say, no, 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 we don't think we should learn the laws of Shabbat from the Mishkan. We think we should learn it another way. And there are going to be 24 prohibitions or 68 prohibitions. or And really, cooking is allowed on Shabbat. So I know that sounds insanely radical, but that's really... Um, that's classical Judaism. How a Sanhedrin, that's what a, a Sanhedrin is. That's what it means to have a Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin, just like Lahabdil, the Supreme Court reinterprets and re the abortion used to be allowed for 50 years. Now the Supreme Court said it is enough. What changed? So, okay, I, I'm, I'm, you don't have to answer the abortion part, but you, you, you get the idea. Things change all the time. So uh, courts review rulings. And this Rav Shechter, who I met in Faraza. My first Shachter, I always go to time. I read me for four years. I bumped into him, if I can use that word. He was in Faraz at the same time we were. I mean, unbeknownst to either of us, whatever. But um, um, what is it? So he often says that Judaism does not rule on precedent. Whereas American law, very often, you know, a judge will say in the 1920 Evans, seven, you know, Evans versus uh, Seventh Circuit uh, Court, whatever, and the, the ruling, and that they cite that as a, a precedent. And Rav Shechter would always tell us Judaism doesn't believe in precedent. Mm -hmm. Not that it's wrong or we can, we have to ignore it, just we're allowed to ignore it. Yeah, it's the Chatham Sofer said something, we should take it into consideration. But as I've mentioned, the number of times where Moshe Feinstein is introduction to the Egroth Moshe is how he's going to disagree with people who he considers greater than himself. He's not uh, saying I'm as great as the Nota Beuda or the Chatham Sofer, but I, in my generation, I'm the leading rabbi. He sort of understood that. He was very modest, but being modest knows, yeah, he didn't say that he's the greatest rabbi, but said that he's entitled to an opinion. And uh, I'm saying he was the greatest post <laughs> The, of the time so of so he's allowed to, to reinterpret to review laws so so we can even do that on a biblical level um if we had a, a sanhedrin and that's why there were two major attempts in jewish history to recreate a, a sanhedrin um the first major attempt was after the spanish expulsion and that's we, Rabbi Yosef Karo was one of the seven people who got smicha. Rabbi Yaakov Beirav gave him smicha, and that's why he wrote the Shulchan Aruch. That's I, I, that's one of the main reasons the Shulchan Aruch was going to be the constitution of this newly created Sanhedrin, and uh, and uh, that fizzled out. That's for another discussion. And then, of course, in 1948, there was an attempt. I remember. I don't know if I mentioned this before. The first year I ever heard Rav Aaron Lichtenstein give, I was. Uh, in the Gris Kolol and Smich at YU. I didn't go to Gush. I was in Yeshiva at Akoto. Maybe I heard him when I was in Gush. I actually, in Yeshiva, I did on a, on, on a Friday night. But I never heard him give a Gmar Shir until I was in the Gris Kolol. And we were learning Sanhedrin that year. And his first year was on how to define Eretz Yisrael. Well, what's the definition of Eretz Yisrael? Why? Because there's a halakha that you can only give smith, you can only give rabbinic ordination in the land of Israel. And he said, are there different definitions for the land of Israel? For Truman Maser, maybe it's a different definition. And as part of that shear, he made us known of the book, Yehuda Leib Maimon. People know who Yehuda Leib Maimon is? Anybody know who Yehuda Leib Maimon is? Nobody knows. Okay. Was he a genius who was was he a genius who got married at 13? Is that possible? It is possible, but I don't know. He he's not he he's in history not known as a great, you know, 
Well, he was obviously a, a serious Talmud Chacham, but he himself didn't require uh, One it. of the founders of Mizrahi, like very involved. Yeah, I don't know if he was the founder of Mizrahi, right. but he was correct. He was the first minister of religion, I believe. In then that's not who I'm thinking of. Never mind. He would have liked my man, the um, Mosad Rav Kook has a whole thing about him. He was a, a tons of book. He wrote this six volume, fascinating. If you have nothing, like one summer, you want to relax. Uh, I don't think again. it's translated English. Sarei Hamea. The Princes of the Hundred. This is from 1840 to 1940. No, the Hebrew dates, the, the you know, the century ends at, you know, 1240, 1340. We're 240 years difference between the English and the Hebrew. They were, what are we, five, seven, eight, four, and we're 2024 20, now. That's 240 years. Forget the, the, the thousands. So he wrote Sarah Hamea about the great rabbis who lived between 1840 and 1940, many of whom he met. He, he was obviously a very friendly, he would make himself, uh, he would meet all these rabbis and he wrote all the stories. It's very fascinating, very uh, atypical. But he wrote a book uh, that Rav Lichtenstein mentioned, Chatshuda Sanhedrin Bismanazeh, the renewal of the Sanhedrin in our time. I have it at home, I brought it, and uh, it's um, 75 pages. Basically, it's a plea to the rabbis to Gedolim, Gedolim. You know, he didn't consider himself on that level. The 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 true leader, Rav Herzog, who's who, whose grandson, you know, we met yesterday. The, the president of Israel, you know, Rav Herzog was the Gaon Shevik Onim. You know, people don't realize Rav Yashiv used to go to the the Shirim of Rav Herzog. I, I told you many times the Nakama Leibowitz story, right? Every remember? Should I do I have to say it over the Nakama Leibowitz story of Rav Herzog? Zeb, sure, say it, say it over. Say it over. I should say it over. Oh my gosh. Okay. The Kamalivitz told us she went to ask Rav Herzog once where um, the source of something was. She didn't know where it was. So she went to Rav Herzog and she asked Rav Herzog. And Rav Herzog went like this. It's not in the Babylonian Talmud. It's not in the Babylonian Talmud. And then Rav Herzog told her, I cannot do that with the, I think she, if I remember correctly, with the Talmud Yerushalmi, he can't do that. He, he referred to, I can't go through the Talmud Yerushalmi like this, but the Talmud Bavli, he could go through like this. The Bavli is alone himself. That reminds you, of course, they have the other story when Rav Chaim, Rav Zevin quotes the story, Rav Chaim Soloveitchik, a different method of learning. So uh, Rav Chaim Soloveitchik, somebody once quoted something, um, a Tosva to Rav Chaim Soloveitchik. So Rav Chaim said, that's not, that's not in Tosva. Tosva doesn't say that. So the person asked Rav Chaim, do you know every Tosva that you know? So Rav Chaim says, no, I don't. But I know Tosvot well enough to know he could never say such a thing. That's a very different style. That's the brisker style analysis. But then there's the Bikiyu style, where you just know, you know, put a pin in the Talmud, and you know everywhere, different styles of learning. Anyways, um, so that people like Rav Herzog, people on that level, should recreate a, um, a Sanhedrin. That was the book, and he, it's based on a Rambam. I mean, it's not the, you, you made it up. The, the Rambam writes, you rally, the Rambam opens up the possibility of reinstituting a Sanhedrin. And it, if and when that happens, first of all, that'll be a wonderful thing. You should know at the time everybody was opposed to it. The Obviously, the more conservative, small C conservative religious groups are going to be opposed to this. this is like too radical. Who do you think you are recreating a Sanhedrin? And obviously, the, the non religious Jews don't want that to have a, what, a, a Supreme Court of, of Jewish law. That's ridiculous. So nobody wanted it. And that was the time, I think, the brisker up put Hechel Shlom with the Kherim, uh, whenever they, you know, they, anyways, it's, uh, it is what it is. Uh, by the way, the fight in the, in the, in the 1500s and 16th century Sfat was bitter, 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 bitter a few more times. In other words, the debate over the Rinches Yusmicha was horrific. And uh, like the judicial reform debate, but probably worse. In other words, they didn't have hundreds of thousands of people, but the the language and the vitriol that the rabbis on each side expressed towards one each other was was horrific. It was like you know the future of the of the Jewish people. Like like it was a judicial reform debate. <laughs> it was exactly the same idea, but just uh, halakhically. If you want, if you're interested in the subject, Jacob Katz has written a fair bit about it. I don't. No, if it's been translated into English. Um, but anyway, so that's um, but that's what so getting back to 630 minutes, why it's all important. So if we have a Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin will decide. Uh, I always say, I hope they don't decide this, but the, a lot of people hope the Sanhedrin will decide no more two days yontif in Israel, uh, outside of Israel. They'll they'll decide all kinds of things because they'll have the um authority. So that's so, but the 630 meets what that can never change. 
written in the biblical text. So th that's what makes something a mitzvah. If it's written, that that's God's divine eternal word. God's divine eternal word we can never change. The rabbinic understanding, how to read God's words, how to translate it into our life and read between the lines, that can change. Different rabbis will read it in different ways in different times. But we don't have the ability. But that, I think, is the core difference. That's why it's important. For us, practically, it makes no difference if it's really one of Tariyak mitzvot or not. It's a mitzvah. I mean, sometimes there is an argument of it is a mitzvah, it isn't a mitzvah, like 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 living in Israel. Uh, the Rambam seems to claim there is no obligation to live in Israel. It's a nice thing to do, but it's not it's not an, there's no obligatory mitzvah to live in Israel. The Ramban strong strongly disagrees and he says there is an important mitzvah to live in Israel. Whatever it is, there are many debates. So we we don't have um a list, but anyways, that's uh I think um, I don't know if I said all of this back in June, but I said some of this. Okay, let's uh, move on. I said I, I the last thing I have in my notes is how how Trashot can change. I said this is where I got up to. So now we can start afterwards. Okay, so um, um, the the Rambam, you know, in his introduction to each set of laws in the Mishnah Torah, always tells you how many mitzvot there are. So. Uh, They'll tell you, like, I think there are five mitzvot on Shabbat, and there are 51 about Avodah Zarah. 51, that's like, I don't know, 8% of the Torah and mitzvot is about I, I, idolatry. We it's we don't we don't relate to these mitzvot. Like, they're not like, you know, we don't really go there. Um, it doesn't impact on us so much. But, uh, and he writes in there how many mitzvot there are. And that's uh, what some people claim that the, um, and it's clearly what the Rambam is doing in the Mishnah Torah is explaining what the 613 mitzvot is. His Sefer HaMitzvot, the book of mitzvot, which is the introduction to the Mishnah Torah, is the book to explain how do we get to 613 mitzvot. So he gives you the 14 principles, the rabbinic law, that's number one. And number two, what I said, if it's a drasha, it's not included. If it's not permanent, there are lots of things in the Torah, let's say on Pesach. That was meant for the generation that left Egypt. That, that doesn't apply to us. Uh, sometimes it's not so easy to tell if it's just meant for one generation or not. But if you assume something is meant for only one generation, as a matter of fact, the Megillah Esther, not the poor Megillah Esther, Megillah Esther from Moshe de Leon. I, I don't know if it's Moshe de Leon. I think it's de Leon. Megillah Esther is one of the commentaries on Saber and Sweat. He's a very famous comment. It's the only thing... Well, People like me who who can't go like this, but probably the uh, I know one thing about the the, the Megillah Esther. That's what most people know. Uh, the one thing that made the Megillah Esther famous, the Megillah Esther defended the Rambam from the attacks of the Rambam. The Rambam would often attack the Rambam. You're wrong. You know, uh, on, on 31 meets foot, they disagree. Like living in Israel. So the Megillah Esther always comes to the defense of the Rambam. We always have people like that, like uh, the the Ramban comes to the defense of the Rif. You know, there are always people who attack, and then there are people who defend, even if they don't necessarily believe in the defense, but they offer a defense. I don't really think defense is right, but you could understand why the Rambam said this, even though I don't think he is correct in what he said. So that um, so the uh, Megillah Esther defends the Rambam. Why isn't living in Israel a mitzvah? Like the Ramban has all these proofs, it's a mitzvah. So what's the defense of the Megillah Esther? Anybody know? It's basically Satmar. That's the defense. Is a, it was before Satmar. But the defense is that the mitzvah of Israel was only a temporary mitzvah. When the, we were exiled in the year 70, the mitzvah stopped applying. How do we know the mitzvah stopped applying? Because the Gemara has this uh, idea that when we were in exile, God made us take three oaths. Uh, we had to swear that uh, we're not going to go up to Israel against the will of the nations. We're not going to go up in mass. Nations won't uh, subjugate us. And that Gimu Shvuot, which is the ideology of, of Satmar. Sat yeah, it's the Satmar ideology, basically. Uh, not basically, exactly. Uh, that's the Satmar ideology, that it's uh, not only is it not a mitzvah, it's prohibited. <laughs> what do you mean it's not a mitzvah? It's prohibited to set up a state before Yimun HaMashiach, and therefore it's uh, there's no mitzvah to live in Israel. <laughs> it's almost a prohibition. An individual is allowed to live in Israel, but you're not allowed to send a, a community. I don't know exactly where, where the, the break is, but I assume Petach Tikva, I think that was the first one of the settlements. One of the, it, it, it's prohibited. You're, you're not allowed to set it up. The Gemara and Ksubas, the Gemara, he, I'm not making this. The, the Halik of Gemara, the, you know, the Gimel Shvod. So uh, there are many answers. Uh, the Gimel Shvod is not accepted. The Gimel Shvod was popular until the, until the Holocaust. And until the Holocaust, most rabbis, yeah, that was always the view. We wait for the Messiah. 
uh, Hitler changed that. So and now, so uh, but Satmar was in the majority. Now they became in the minority. They're the only ones holding up the true Torah path. Everybody else reformed and went terrible things, and you know, a new Sanhedrin, whatever. And we hold on to the old ways of the Gemara. No Jewish state, God forbid, until the coming of the of the Messiah. So that's what the Megillah Esther. He doesn't uh, obviously it's less without the political baggage. But the Megillah Esther explains that's why the Rambam doesn't count living in Israel as a mitzvah. Which it's not like it's. Uh, uh, it's not like you can't cook on Shabbos. It's doesn't. It's not counted, but it's a biblical prohibition, even though it's not counted. No, living in Israel is not only is it not counted. It's it's not a mitzvah. Like it's it's bad uh, to go on Aliyah with the Karen. Now, Obviously, that's not the view. I, I I think anybody anybody who's in this class um, who accepts that view probably shouldn't be here. You know, I don't think this is the right place for you if that's what you believe, because obviously uh, that comes with other beliefs that we very much don't hold by, at least here. Okay, anyway, so that's, um, but the mitzvah of Talmud Torah is really, as the Rambam was saying, is the mitzvah to learn what the 613 mitzvot are. Wh why? So this I heard from Rav Shachter many years ago, and uh, so at the, basically, um, what is it, you know, if I'd asked you what type of book is, is it, this is actually a fascinating discussion. When I can leave that dozens every once in a while, what type of book is the Torah? How we, if you're going to the library, you go to, I, I don't want to say Harvard anymore. Uh, I don't know what universities are left. Uh, University of Maryland, I don't know. Uh, you go to some nice part of university. Lots, lots, I haven't heard of any, what the anti-Semitism is like there. So you go to the, the library, University of Maryland or NYU, whatever, um, um, actually, I'll say Yale University because a, a friend of mine is a pres is friends with the the president of Yale. They were in Yale together. It's act you know the, the president of Yale is actually um, a Soloveitchik. I don't know if people know that, right? Do people know that the president of Yale University? Yes, name yes, is some of us Soloway. know that. His name is Soloway. Uh, obviously, he uh, but he's part of the Solo and he knows he knows he's part of the Soloveitchik family. And so my friend, my my good friend. Uh, is um one they were in Yale together and they're friendly. He told me now, just with everything going on, he's trying to very much, you know, do that. And my friend told him, told Soloway that he quoted him the Pasuk in in, in Megillah Esther and the real Megillah Esther. Um imla e kazot. He got the machut. Maybe God put you as a friend of Yale for this moment to steer Yale, you know, to be a moral um, clarity like Joe Biden is, you know, to be moral, clear. But anyway, so where would you put the, the Torah? What section of the library would you put the Torah? History. Well, it's really debatable. Narrative, uh, ethics, legal. Philosophy. I'm sorry, Yochebe? Oh. I'm saying it's debatable. On one hand, it has a legal aspect to it. On the other hand, there's narrative. There's also ethics. So it really doesn't fit one category. I hope it's in, in nonfiction. That's the one thing I think we can all agree. It's in the nonfiction category because there are people who, no, I, this isn't um, a joke. I mean, I mean, for us, we can laugh at that, but there are many people who there's made up stories by you know, a bunch of people 3,000 years ago. And uh, and the truth of that, the Rambam sort of says that in certain, not that it's fiction, but he, he says, you know, dreams, part of the tour where dreams didn't really happen. So that that's, so we first have to agree it's in the nonfiction, you know, so even that's not a thousand percent clear. And then we got to go to, um, got to figure out it's history, it's law, it's philosophy. I don't know, poetry, maybe, maybe a little bit. The, the, why do I put the Torah in the book um, in the in the poetry section? Because the Torah says it's poetry, right? The, the, the Torah, the six hundred. But the Rambam assumes is the six hundred and thirteenth mitzvah, right? In fact, it is Kvatem Kitul Chemet Hashira Hazot. Write for you this song. Now, in the pshat, this is in the pshat. It means Shirat Hazinu. That's right before that. There's a song, Hazino Shemaim Adabera. But in the Drash, which I guess could change, but in, in in the Drash, the rabbis interpret that to mean the entire Torah is a Shira, and you have to write down, that's the mitzvah, to write down a Sefer Torah. So we'll get to, uh, why don't people do that anymore? So this is fascinating. Why? Why? How many people here have, have commissioned the Sefer Torah? You don't have to raise your hand. Because uh, then I'll ask you for a oh, donation. Because now we have access. You can afford to donate to Sefer Torah. You're giving ten thousand dollars to Torah Motion, okay? So because uh, the commission of Sefer Torah has got to be today. I don't know seventy five thousand dollars. It's uh, expensive. So some people say that's why you you don't have to spend more than a fifth of your income or asset, whatever, a fifth of something, income, assets, 
on any mitzvah. So it's too expensive. People can't afford it. That's the, the technical reason, but that's not the reason I go by. Uh, the reason we have uh, access to all today, we have access to all kinds right, of we, reform, just the, mitzvah, really have the mitzvah doesn't apply life. anymore. Yeah, reform the mitzvah doesn't. Why doesn't the mitzvah apply? And teach it to the Jewish people. You know, for the first 2,000 years of Jewish history, 1,500 years, you were not allowed to write down the oral law. So the only mechanism, the only book you could use to teach the Torah was the Torah itself. But now that we have Mishnah and Talmud and Art Scroll and Koran and everything in between, so we can uh, we don't need a Torah. Who learns from a Sefer Torah? You know, anybody who takes out a Sefer Torah when they want to learn, we consider that disrespectful. It's mm -hmm. disrespectful to go to the shul and take out a Sefer Torah. And the whole purpose of writing the mitzvah of writing to, is to teach that the, the Torah tells you the reason. When the Torah tells you the reason, the reason doesn't apply. This is said by no less an authority than Rabbi Noasher, the Rush. The Rush is in the back of every Gemara, uh, the leader, you know, of, of German Jewry in the 13th century. Then he moved to, to Spain when the Maram of Rutenberg got a Arrested in 1286, uh, the rush fled. I don't know if he quite, maybe he fled a little later. I don't know exactly when, but he becomes rabbi in Toledo, Spain, not Ohio. In 13, oh, I maybe I'm in Toledo, Toledo, I don't know. Uh, Spain in 1302. And there's Ashkenazic rabbi in Sfar. He was the Gadolador. I mean, him uh, and the Rashba. The Rashba sent the message to the Jews in Toledo. I know he's Ashkenazi. You know, it's, it's Spain. It's not like today. Ashkenazi and Sfardim, you know, married each other. Are you kidding? So, um, but he was such a great person. So the, the Rush quotes this, and it's quoted in the Shulchan Aruch. And the Ramah accepts this opinion that the mitzvah no longer applies today. So I've said many, many times that uh, I don't want to, I'm glad. Okay, so nobody commissioned a Sefer Torah? Okay, good. Because now uh, I can see what I'd uh, like to... Yes. Marty, uh, you, you, you commissioned one? No. <laughs> so wait, wait one second and then I'll let you ask. So now, I can, now I don't want I won't insult anybody, God God forbid. So I'm uh, I think it's one of the worst uses of money that you give. If a person that I'm I'm saying in a very strong language, I know. But if you have money to give to charity, one of the worst places you can do is write a safer tour. I know they do it. The grandfather passed away, this one died. Well, there are 90% of Sifre Torah in the world are used on Simchas Torah alone to try to find people who carry a hakafa. You know, it's too many, it's too heavy, they don't want the hakafa. Most Sifre Torah are never used. And why somebody would spend, why we, we have Jews without an education, let's put a real Sefer Torah, let's create people who know the Torah. That's what the Gemara says, how stupid people are. The Gemara in Maka says, Kama tipshe inshi. That's the Gemara. I'm just tipesh, a tipesh. That's the youth of the Gemara. People are foolish. You know why they're foolish? What happens when, you know, they open up the Aaron Kodesh and they take out the Sefer Everybody jumps up from their seat. And what happens when a Torah scholar walks into the room? Everybody falls asleep. Who cares? Then the Gemara is saying, what idiots? The Torah scholar, that's the real Torah. That's, a, that's why you rip Kriya. When a Torah gets burned, God forbid, just like you rip Kriya when a person dies, the person and the Torah, they're the same thing. It's one and the same. So this is a real Torah. This is just ink on parchment, like Rav Hananya ben Trajan said. You know, we see it when they were burning him, uh, the Romans, you know, the famous story. He said, what do you see? He says, the letters are flying heavenly. The, the parchment is being burned. So that's um, so uh, a real Sefer Torah. Let's invest in Jewish. Yeah, I don't understand why people give Sefer Torah. I mean, I understand the psychological, but whatever. So I'm sorry if you don't agree with me. That's the Seder. But uh, that's what I feel. But I only say that because yeah. nobody here dedicated a Sefer Torah. If somebody did, I uh, God forbid, I they mean well. They mean well. Not Kasvashon, they're wonderful people. But it's just really, really dumb way to give your money. And uh, you have to give your your money smart. We don't have money. Yes, okay. Now, Marty, Chris. Well, uh, you... Oh, I love you. You were talking, oh, you were talking a few minutes ago about when, what? When how do you know the mitzvah apply? I think just last week there was a, I think it was in the process year last week, the person said something about if, if a mitzvah had been, had been fulfilled once, it doesn't have to be fulfilled again. He was talking about a minhag. Yeah, there is an idea. It, it see, it's very interesting. 
Um, it's actually but her. What, what, what were you talking? <laughs> I think you're talking about Rab, Rabbi Rabbi Tabas was shared last week on Baichi. But I think if I remember correctly, he's talking about if can you change you have to the Dharma when when things can change. It's actually he didn't go into this part, but it's actually easier if we had a Sanhedrin. It's e much easier to change a biblical law than a rabbinic law. Because or um, a minag. Once something come um established, like this um, matter of fact, this came up on my trip here in Israel. Somebody, I what was it? Just came up yesterday or something. Somebody, oh yeah, I know why it came up. Um, someone who's asking, he had a certain chumra he was doing. And then he came to Israel and he wanted to know if he still had to do the chumra. So the person asked him, Did you do were you doing the chumra because you knew you didn't have to and you're being more strict? Or did you do it because you thought that was the law? So Ramosha has a chuba about this. If you think it's the law, then you don't have to do it anymore. I thought the halakha said X. Now the halakha doesn't say X. I don't have to observe X. But if I know the halakha doesn't say X, but I want to be strict. I want to be strict. So I, I know I don't have to be. That, oh, that's very hard. That's a tarot nidarin. You have nidid. And then you have rabbinic law. Also, with, um, once it spreads, it, it's actually harder to change. Because basically, when you're changing the biblical laws, what you're saying is the rabbinic interpretation was incorrect. And if something is incorrect, I don't have to do it. When you have a rabbinic law, the rabbis know that you're allowed to eat chicken and milk and melt together. Everybody knows that. They just said, no, you can't You can't do that because we're afraid. That is much, much harder to change. You need gadol b'chakmo u'beminyan. You need a greater and a more greater quantity and greater quality in the court to change something, which we assume we don't really have. So um, anyway, so it's very interesting that sometimes I mean, Hagim and rabbinic laws are harder to change than actual biblical laws. But let me, um, so I think that's what he was referring to. If you do the minag once, some, it's really, they say th three times, like people eat, don't eat the brux on Pesach. And then they say they want to eat the brux on Pesach because who wants to not eat half the food you can eat on Pesach? <laughs> but uh, so it depends. Why are they not eating the brux? If they think it's chametz and there was a safe chametz, today it's all different. We make it much different. Like it, maybe there was a, a legitimate fear 200 years ago. Today, the fear of the Brux is non existent. And um, well, then, then uh, okay. But if you're doing it, you know you can eat it, but you have a minute not to eat it. That's much harder to change. But, anyways, let's get back to what the Torah is, right? I'm trying to ask you something. Um, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, oh, uh, I want people to interrupt me. I mean, you know, not always, but often. Rabbi Sachs has a beautiful um, idea where he says, there are text books and there are text people where he talks about people who know a lot of Torah and that you should honor them by standing up for the text people, similar right, to the idea you were and saying. That's what the Gemara, he's basing it on that Gemara in Makwa, the end of right. Makwa. That's um, yeah. Then, um, at the beginning of this war, they had asked women to light an extra candle on Erev Shabbos. So I've been doing that. Now, does that become something that I have to continue indefinitely? Does that- no, I, I don't know. I'm not a post here. So I think they would probably tell you, just have in mind, you don't do it indefinitely. See, see, um, you know, but like That's all what, the hill they thought. had, you know, like when, so it's very interesting. I mean, as you know, so I've been to five different shuls. I don't know exactly in the week that I've been here, not one of them says Avinu Malkeinu. Never have I heard. My shul, they say Avinu Malkeinu Shakri I, I already mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I'm I'm against it. I, I it, it it takes away from its meaning. And here I am in Israel. Don't, nobody says Avinu Malkeinu. I mean, I haven't been to any minion that says it yet. They make one Misha bear at the end. They made, uh, in on Thursday morning on uh, the Pinsker building, they made uh, a Misha bear for the, the hostages. Okay, very nice. I... I they didn't do it the other days. I think just when they're doing laning, whatever, it's different. Because once you do something, routine, then it becomes part of the doubling. And then, then well, oh, well, that's then, our minute. Like, have a minute to, to say a vino What do you have a minute to say a vino okay, no. Like that's, so I, I don't know. I don't know. But that's, uh, but that's what you need leaders for. But yeah, if you're doing one thing, it should be for the thing. I, I, I don't exactly, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. What's the connection between lighting an extra candle? That the there's some, I, just, Nebuch, there is some women who can't. Who Sorry. can't light? Women who can't light because they're in the army. Either that or because they're chatufim. Okay, oh, they're chatufim. Okay, in the army. Okay, all right. Okay, I, I, I it's interesting. It's a nice thing. I, I guess. I, I just don't. You know. Okay. 
All right, it's uh, it, you know what what thing? Listen, the classical thing, tshuva tefila utstaka. So I I think whatever stuck is always good, and and tshuva is always good, and tefila is good. I can say we the problem is we improve we work on the quantity of tefila, and we should way work on the quality. We have way too much quantity of dumbling. The quantity of dumbling is way too long. That's why on, on Yom Kippur in the time of the Mishnah, the girls and guys could go dancing in the fields and go on dates and shidduch. And today, you get a 45-minute break, depending on what shul you get. You, you go to YU, they start at 7 in the morning and have a 30-minute break. You go to any yeshiva in Israel, who, who has a break? Got piyuti, more piyuti, this, uh, this, uh, and already already the art school puts you know, a lot in the back, you know, where those want to say more. It's, it's, dumbling is way too long. And and people can't take it, so they mumble. They and the dumbling has to finish in X hours. You know, dumbling over two hours in Shabbos morning today. Who has time for more than a, a two-hour dumbling? And uh, we should improve the quality, not the quantity. We should daven less. Many times we said, I guess we're back to our sitter class now. In the first, it's like Simon in, in the Shulchan Aruch, um, Tov Ma'at Im Kavana Mehar Bey Below Kavana. It's better to dove. You don't have to say Pesukit is him every day. It's okay. You can say part of it. Say Ashrei, and that's it. And the next day, say uh, hallelujah. You don't, it's about that. They say, oh my gosh, well, who is this guy? Like, uh, you know, but people uh, were, were, that's part of the problem of the printed word. That That's part of the of the printing press. You know, when something, what, what's it's an art scroll, the rabbi's dead on arrival. The rabbi can say whatever he wants. The the guy who can't read Hebrew goes to the rabbi. But in art scroll, it says we do this. And that's it. The rabbi's finished. The, Okay, it's not going to go against art scroll, you know, the loser's job. But uh, so it's whatever. I, I, but okay, I think out of the box, or I don't know what to say. But so I think I, I'm not into saying extra to him. I'm, I'm saying, I mentioned last week, Salem, not say, ach, means more than David, out loud, pasuk by pasuk, instead of adding in an extra sheer hamalot, that everybody's in a hurry and they're taking off their tefillin while they're saying it, uh, at least in the men's section, you know, so uh, that's not so respectful, And the, but the people are in a hurry, so just, just, uh, the, whatever, okay, anyways, back here, so, but let's get back to, um, I said, what section we're putting in the Torah, right, we're talking in theory about the 613 mitzvot, which may be the definition of Talmud Torah, and uh, we're explaining now that, the, so where, what type of book is the Torah, so it's an elaborate, so, um, so we say it may belong in the poetry section because it says Hashira Zot. So we explain why Shira, the, uh, which is the mitzvah to write the whole Torah, why we don't do that mitzvah anymore. Fine, but what does it mean, Shira? So there are really two uh, two different explanations given by by two brothers in law by Dinitzi yes, and, and uh, the Aruch Hashochan Yechiel Epstein. They were were brothers in law, and then. Father-in-law and son-in-law, right? Everybody knows that, right? The Dinitziv married his niece, who was 36 years, his his junior after his wife died, and they thought she was nuts. And he said, no, I want to marry Dinitziv. It was a big honor. He was 70 or something, and she was like 35 or 34, I don't know exactly. And they, um, so the Arach Ashokhan, who was his brother-in-law, became his father-in-law. It's a pretty cool trick. I don't know, we're going to try that one day, right? And, uh, and, uh, and that son, of course, they had a very famous son, uh, Rav Meir Barilan. Not 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 to Berlin. Rav Meir Barilan. He was a big Zionist, as it was his father. His father died in 1893. It's pre Herzl, but he he supported the nascent Zionist movement. So his son was a uh, was a real member of the Zionist movement. And of course, uh, he Hebrewized his name to Bar Ilan, and Bar Ilan University is named for uh, Rav Meir Bar Ilan. Uh, you know, then it seems that's one branch of the family. Uh, the other branch, of course, uh, Rav Chaim Soloveitchik married the granddaughter of the Nitziv. Uh, uh, yeah, and as did Shaul Lieberman. Shaul Lieberman married uh, one of the granddaughters of the Nitziv. She was the principal of Shulamis. If anybody went to Shulamis, that so was Shaul Lieberman's wife. Uh, whatever who Mark gave his 18 classes on. Anyways, lots of, you know, money marries money, rabbis marry rabbis. That's the way it goes. That's the way life yeah. works. There used to be rabbis married money. That's uh, That was the old way. That's how rabbis could become rabbis because some rich 
father-in-law would want a, a Talmud Chacham, you know, get a son, but, but it, it takes a long time to become a Talmud Chacham. So the rich father-in-law would uh, get, so it used to be money married rabbis and rabbis married rabbis and money married rabbis, whatever, that's that, that's how life works. Everybody knows that. It's, it's a, that's the social economics of life. Anyway, so these two brothers-in-law, father-in-law, son-in-law, so then, then, then it's Eve, as I discuss this on because it's so beautiful, so beautiful. And his introduction to um to Chumash says why the Torah is a poem. And he explains that the Torah is a poem. Uh, poetry, we reading between the lines is the the words almost are meaningless in a poem. It's reading between the lines. When you have a poem, you write weird words because you want to make it rhyme. So you write things in sort of weird ways to allude. The Torah often writes, you know, an extra word, it's sort of a little jungled, you jump jumble so it wants to hint to something um the essay great poetry has to be interpreted and interpretations change over time they stand the test of that it's exactly what the torah is and he just i mean it could be like an english literature uh you know t teacher of english literature and explaining what poetry is and that's exactly how the torah works and you know what he says it's pretty boring if you don't know what you're doing like because poetry you read it well, what does this mean this is crazy yeah, the more you study it, you see the beauty and you uncover and every generation always finds new meaning in, in great poetry. So that's why the Torah belongs in, in the poetry section, not just Az Yashir Moshe and Hazino. The entire Torah is poetry. His brother-in-law, the Arch Shulchan, explains Shira, not as a poem, but the way we would probably explain it as a song. And he said the Torah is a symphony. And in a symphony, everybody has a part to play. And uh, what are the four things in the symphony? Percussions, I don't remember anymore. Uh, and somebody knows music, please, please tell me. Um, the different, uh, you know. Wind, strings. Wind, right, wind, string. Thank you very much. Right, right. So uh, everybody, play, and sometimes the drummer or the, or the cymbals, they just do one bang. But the whole song would be different if not for that one click. You know, you got to know exactly. And he said, the Torah is a shira. It's a symphony of people coming together with different voices and everybody, everybody adds more. Yeah, but, you know, so it's a beautiful. So the the the, the, the Torah belongs in on the top 100 and the top 10 charts, you know, of the music. And it belongs in the poetry section, the history section, the law section. But why are we mentioning all this? Um, maybe it's interesting because the real section it belongs in and that's how um, the Balatanya, that's what's for, Rav Schechter told us, you know, when I was in, in Shear, he said uh, the real explanation of what the Torah is, and based on, on the Ramban, I believe, the Torah is a description of God. The 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 the, the otiot of the Torah are the description of God. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, uh, I don't exactly know what this means. Obviously, you need some Kabbalistic leanings to know what this means, but the Torah describes God, and, and that's how we explain why you can have mitzvot in the Torah that never have being and never will be, right? The classic thing I'm sure many of you were taught that there was never an irni dachet. There was never a city full of idolaters that's so bad they had to wipe out the whole city. There was never a ben Sora or murrah. There was never a um, rebellious child. So uh, so the, the the Torah says, so um, why why do you need it? Like So the Torah says, drush ukabaschar. In other words, you're right, it's never gonna happen, but we'll learn it and we'll get the reward for learning for Talmud Torah. So the people, what, uh, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Rosh Hashanah means it's something in theory. I, so I learn about the laws of, of Truma in the 1600s or whatever. Even, it'll apply one day. I learn about Binyan Beit Amikdash or Korbanas. It's not that they, I, I can't do it for technical reasons, but that's something in the Torah that will never, ever apply. Just so we get the reward for learning, well, that doesn't make any sense. So that is, um, so that's, that's, uh, there's so much else to learn. No, but no, but there's an aspect of God within Ben Sorum where God has this vengeful side to him, so to speak, where you're going to wipe out the whole city. You know, genocide. I mean, I, I don't want to say it, you know, but that's the ir nidach. We're going to wipe out the whole city. You know, uh, although they cleared it out to people who, who didn't do a vote as it's not pure, just like Amalek. You don't wipe out Amalek. The Rambam writes that you have to give Amalek, you have to offer them peace and you have to let them escape. It's only if they decide not to, then you have to wipe them out. But it's not that we go and wipe them out. Even Amalek, the arch enemy of, of the Jewish people. But anyway, so the 613 meets what is many ways a description of who God is, whatever that means exactly. But every mitzvah, which of course we, on a very basic level, it makes, we understand it. What is the Torah? The Torah is God's command to us. So the Torah is basically describing what God wants. So the Torah, that's what the Torah is. Um, okay. Um, okay. So now, 
God's uh, values. It describes God's values. What God right, values. Right, right, but, but the age may more describes, you know, it's an aspect of God, just like, uh, you know, um, like the 365 negative commandments. So, you know, be, uh, according to the days of the year, right? Uh, 365 days in a year, that's why they're 365 negative commandments. That's what the, the, the Gemara says. What, um, so there is an idea that every day is a different aspect of mitzvah. I, I, I've never learned this and I don't quite understand it because a Hebrew year, a Jewish year never is 365 days, only a solar year. So you, you can say July 4th, but I, I do know that this Zohar that says there, which I haven't learned inside because I'm I'm still under forty intellectually. Um, so uh, uh, the Zohar says the three hundred six five mitzvot. So they 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 start telling you which date which mitzvah. So so Tishavav is Gita Nasha. The the mitzvah for Tishavav is Gita. So I don't know. Go through, I, I don't exactly know if they have the whole list. I'm not sure. But that I remember hearing many years ago that uh, Tisha B'Av corresponds with some Gid Hanasha. And the 248 learn to the limbs of our body. So if the mitzvot are, you know, our, our heart and our, our, our fingernail and what our finger, and we know that there are vital organs and less vital organs. You can live without an arm. You can't live without a heart. So there are 248 mitzvot. Some are vital. Brit Milah, Korban Pesach, some mitzvot. Shh. Shabbat, these are vital mitzvot, whatever. Um, and other mitzvot are, are not so vital. It's nice. It's uh, it's not the end of the world. You don't put on tefillin. I, I'm not telling anybody not to put on tefillin. But it's like the world doesn't come to an end. Now, so the Gemara does like tefillin a lot. But, do you uh, think it's possible do you think it's possible that the drush, the kabel, tzachar, the pshat is the tzachar of drush is the, the, is, is, the, is itself, is yeah, it's kar mitzvah mitzvah, but but the assumption is, listen, I I would Rav Shach used to say this all the time. Uh, he he more than other people, much more than the solid, much more than the brisker style. The goal of learning is 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 halacha. That's if you know Rav, Rav Shachter, that's him. We learn to know to paskin halacha. That that's the only reason we learn. There, who cares that uh, we learn by, like to learn all the stuff without a, which is sort of how the Rambam decided to learn. That's really that's what the Rambam. You don't need all this more. Okay, he's not saying you shouldn't learn more, but the purpose of learning is, um, you know, to learn what the halacha is. And and the brisker derech totally revamped that. That 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 was a revolution. And I don't have to tell you, even though the brisker derech conquered the world, uh, many of the gedolim at the time hated it. They thought it was terrible. They thought this is a the fame, you know the Ritvas famously called it, it it chemistry. And he wasn't because he you know believed in getting a PhD in chemistry. That wasn't the compliment. And uh, Rav Chaim was a chemist. He takes the, the parts and he puts them together, analyzes it. That's not Torah. That's not the, the, the traditional way of learning Torah. And therefore, briskers can't paskin. Everybody knows that. Briskers don't know how to paskin because they can always see two sides of every issue and two ways to look at a, 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 a Should it be like this or should it be like that? If it's like this, it's like this. Okay, so which is it? You know, like... Uh, but uh, so that's a real issue. And that's why the great Puskin never came from the world of, of Brisk, because they don't know how to Puskin. And uh, whatever, that's just the way. Yocheved, I see you want, to, you want to say something, or you don't. Oh, well, I'm just going back to the idea of this of the text people. So when Rav Unterman came, I think in the 40s, he kissed Rav Soloveitchik, and then he yeah. explained to Rabbi Lamb that how could you not kiss a Torah? So yeah, I can, I can just, serve, right? uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Listen, Spartak world. I heard Rav Avadi Yosef speak twice in uh, in my life. I went when I was in yeshiva, so I went to hear him once. On he spoke every Saturday. I'm talking now in the 80s, early 80s, probably 1980. And I remember the first time I heard him speak, he spoke on the minhag not to get married in sphere, and he thought that wasn't such a good minhag. Then you can violate that minhag. What, what do you mean, not get married in Sphira? Getting married is like the most important mitzvah. Well, when you're not going to get married in Sphira, it's time to get married. Get married whenever you can. Get married this good. So you get married in Sphira. I, I don't know that he was saying it, Allah, the, the, the Maisa, but that's, I, I remember I was, you know, 18 years old. And I remember Rabbi Yosef, he was very sort of critical of this minhag. It's a minhag, but it's a difficult minhag. I, I don't remember the whole thing. But of course, what else I remember is everybody kissed him. Kissed his hand when he came in in the Spartak world. They kissed their rabbis. In the Ashkenazic world, they they spit on the rabbi. Oh no, no, no! I shouldn't say that. But in certain rabbi, it depends. There is a there is a problem of. I mean, on on the one hand, we have too much respect for rabbis, like too much. 
deference and the rabbi says something nobody questions that's not good it was never good and that's not, but on on the other hand they they only they don't really listen to i mean i don't have to whatever and, and get into it so much but believe me if the rabbi says something and the balabatim don't like it they, they don't listen when when the a good had tried to uh bring in uh what the the sumptuary laws, whatever that word is, uh, sumptuary laws that uh, you can't spend too much money on on a wedding. So people they laughed at them and they, they went apart because the the rich people weren't going to have the rabbi tell them how much money they can spend on a wedding. And then they made exceptions. Well, this and that. Once you make exceptions, that's it. You're finished. The ger ger is the only community that successfully does that. That uh, the ger rabbi, I, rabbi say no, he he can't spend more money. And they, they they follow him from what I understand. But uh, you know the people they don't care. They they listen to the rabbis when the rabbis say something they they agree with. It's like uh, Mark Shapiro would always say if uh, I don't know who the who's the, the god of Lador today in the Karedi world. I don't even know. It's after Rav Steinman and Rav Eli, Rav Yashi, Rav Steinman, uh, Rav um, Chaim Kanievsky. I, I I don't know who's next. I I really don't know. I, I should know, but whoever it is, if you were to get up tomorrow and say we should say hello on Yom Atzmut, they wouldn't say hello on Yom Atzmut. They would throw him out. They'd say he's not from our world anymore. He left. In other words, they wouldn't say, "Oh, he's a God of Israel," and maybe because of what's going on in Israel, we should be thankful we have a state of Israel defend us. They, they would say he he lost his marbles, and we're going to find a new God. Though. So uh, whatever, there's not so much. The respect is skin deep in in the Spartac world. I think there's much more respect. Anyways, that's how I see it. Maybe I'm totally wrong, and maybe your experiences are um, are different. But anyways, every every mitzvah in the Torah represents an aspect of um, um, Okay, what I want to do. We don't have that much time left, and we have to wait till my next trip to continue. I hope. Um, so, um, but I, I really wanted to cover the different levels of Torah. Well, I said, I think I wrote that, what are the 600 mitzvot and the thousands of non-mitzvot, like not to cook on Shabbos. Oh, oh, Rabbi Kelman? Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, but did you explain what the Arach HaShulchan said? Maybe you didn't, I missed it. Yes, the Arach HaShulchan, the symphony, music. Oh, the symphony, right. The, okay, the sorry symphony. about that. Oh, Shira, Shira is music, not poetry. The, right. Then it seems it's a little bit more, it's it's very beautiful. It's also more famous because it's in his introduction to the Torah, his Kidmata Amek, and it's in the introduction to his commentary on the Torah. The Arach HaShulchan, it's in like a really weird place. And it's sort of in the middle of his introduction to Choshen Mishvat. The Arach HaShulchan was halachist. And he was wrote the Arach so it's a great halachist. And so he, he must have written Yehoshim Mishpat first, not Orachim. And he writes a, a three-page introduction and sort of like in the middle, somewhere he throws in this line about, so you're like, if you're not learning, like it's much harder to find. It's just not as well known, but it's more in keeping with the, what I think. Yes. Uh, so what does he mean by symphony, the different voices of Klal Yisrael? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, every Jew contributes in a different uh -huh. way. Everybody. Okay. Not Our, interpretation. I assume interpretation too. We have Beit Hill and Beit Shammai or Elu Beit uh -huh. He so, he doesn't. Ex I mean, I can look it up again. He doesn't explain himself at great length. It's just a sort yeah. of a throwaway sentence. You know, the Torah is a shira. Many voices come together, just like in a, a symphony. I don't know if he uses that word. What's it? But he does use something. It's like music, and every instrument has their own piece. And some only play a little bit. Some are playing all the time. But it's the harmony. What makes the Torah great is the many voices. And that's, uh, I've said many times, we, they said, I'm here on a trip. I, I, this is more voices than many people would, would, would like, but I, you know, I'm on a trip with, uh, it was an Orthodox and sort of and reform rabbis, you know, so whatever, there, there is what to learn even from rabbis or from people for how long made me call it down. When Ben, ben Azai, Ben Zoma says, made me call it we can learn, we can learn from other, other people and even people we don't have see together ideologically, right? In most conservative reform schools, people talk less than in Orthodox schools. In many, not, not always. That's something we can learn from them. There, there are all kinds of things we can learn. We can learn from everybody. So um, anyways, that's just... Um, you know, but that that's what he explains it. But he's he's talking, of course, obviously within a, a, a traditional framework, but everybody has their role to add. Okay, what I'll very briefly do, because I, I we do then soon, is I just well I'll mention sort of the different um sort of levels of Torah mitzvot. So we explained already uh the six hundred and thirteen mitzvah means it's written in the Torah. That's how the Rambam explains it. If it's not a verse in the Torah, lo, lo tevashok di b'chalei b'mo, whatever that means. So, lo tirzach, lo tignov, you know, zachor et yom ha-shabbat le-kot show, that's 
um, um, a mitzvah. The interpretation of that mitzvah can explain, but there is going to be a mitzvah that can never change to remember our 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 Shabbat. So that's um, that's the highest level Torah Shabbat. Then we have our drashot, so we talk about the interpretations of Torah, which are considered biblical law, but they're not considered part of the 613 mitzvot. And then we have, I think, even a little bit above the drashot, or we call halakha l'moshem misinai. That's, uh, we don't really have time to get into that. These, uh, it's generally understood to mean laws that were dictated to Moshe at Mount Sinai have zero biblical reference. There's, you can read the Torah with all the poetry in the world and all the between the lines in the world, and you'll never know that tefillin should be black. There's nothing in the Torah that hints that tefillin should be black. That's a halacha Moshe misina. That's a law given to Moshe at Mount Sinai. That's why you've never seen a blue pair of, of tefillin. We would assume you did not fulfill the mitzvah. Your tefillin are blue. Um, interestingly enough, uh, who, who cares? Well, why? Well, who, right? Our, our, our tzitzis are blue, you know? Whatever. So we have Halakh the Moshe um, Sinai. It's a light, slightly lower status than something written in the Torah itself. Um, okay, that is, but those are the three types of biblical law that Torah um, Shemachtav, Halakh the Moshe Sinai, and our Drashot. We have this in between category, the Vrei Kabbalah. Uh, we assume reading the Megillah on Purim is the Vrei Kabbalah. The Vrei Kabbalah is generally, all these three require, of course, more discussion, but just as a very brief overview, the Vrei Kabbalah, we assume, are um, things written in Tanakh, but not in the Torah itself. For example, Kabbalah and Onik Shabbos is based on a Pasuk in Yishayahu. Um, uh, fifth, chapter 55, 56, you should walk differently, you should talk differently, you should dress differently on Shabbat. So that's the right from a verse in Yishayahu. So it's not the right, it's not biblical in the classical sense. It's not rabbinic either. It's from a, a prophet. So that's what we call the Vrei Kabbalah. So we assume Megillah Esther, reading Megillah Esther is the Vrei Kabbalah, sort of a words of... Uh, or, or just, that's a higher status than a, um, a rabbinic law. Um, and then we have takanot, where just ra rabbis making... I put, uh, did I not put it in the right one? I thought I put it in the slate. You can't marry... Uh, $500? Hold on, I assume you're not asking the question. So if you mute yourself, please, if you don't mind. And then um, um, you have... Um, Maybe takanot, something fell you off. More than one wife. Why don't I... Okay, give me one second. Okay. And then we have our 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 say, right? You can't do A because it might lead to B. You can't eat chicken because it, chicken and milk, because you may accidentally eat meat and milk. But it's just A may lead to B. Really, it's allowed. And then the lowest form of anything is minhag. But that people take minhag very seriously. Okay, so we'll have to discuss that, um, please God, and some other time. But just let's quickly review. We went over the whole notion of the, just briefly, the 613 mitzvot, uh, where it gets, we don't have an agreed upon list. Um, and the the, the Bahag, the Rambam, the Ramban, and and uh, and the Megillah and Esther is always defending the Rambam, and therefore he says living in Israel, not only is it not a mitzvah, it's a prohibition to set up a community. Of course, nobody accepts that outside of the Satmar world. But it's not that they're based on nothing. It's based on a Gemara in Subas that people followed. So the Zionists changed the way we look at the, the return to Zion for, for 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 good reason. But we don't have but what the mitzvot are. The mitzvot are very important because that can change. Everything else can change. Rabbinic interpretation can change. Everything else can change, but not the taryak mitzvot that are based on verses in, in the Torah. The interpretation of those verses could change. We can't change them. Yudalei Maimon tried to set up a Sanhedrin. Rav Yaakov Be'i Rav. Yismicha to Rav Yosef Karo. But these things did not last. And uh, the attempts of Yehuda Leib Maimon went nowhere uh, for obvious reasons. It, it, these things are, I, I don't know how we're going to change that, but uh, change is very slow, especially radical change like that. So not, um, uh, except that we spoke of why there's no mitzvah to write uh, a Sefer Torah. Where do we put the Sefer Torah? History, law, philosophy. It's all, all are true, but also poetry and song. We went through that, and then we just started to discuss very briefly the different levels of mitzvot in the Torah. And it's important to know, is something a rabbinic mitzvah, is something only a minhag, is something the Kabbalah, because it has great importance halakhically for extenuating circumstances when you can ignore it, what do we do there? It's, it's very important to know. 
Um, it's not just all the law is the same. No, it's not the same. It's very different. Okay, let me just so quickly. What's the speak. difference between takanot and gzeirot, Rabbi Kalman? Takanot are positive things. The rabbis sort of invent a new law. They say uh, a takana is you can't marry more than one wife. The Torah allows you to marry more uh -huh. than one wife. Okay. Um, right. Uh, you can't, uh, the cherem, the, right. A gzeira is don't uh, do A lest it come to B. Uh, you have a prohibition Torah, so I'm not allowed to climb a tree. Not that I'm not allowed to climb a tree. Well, I'm afraid if I climb a tree, I'll break a branch. And breaking a branch is a biblical prohibition. I can't eat chicken and milk. 80%, I don't know what the number is, a very high percentage of things we do not do on Shabbat are because we're afraid it's going to lead to, to, uh, to our, our like kibra. a fe Like a fence so like around. Yeah, it's a, a fence. Yeah, yeah right. fence. Okay. Isn't, there, isn't there a concept that you're not supposed to learn anything? You froze. You froze. Oh, from nach. I'm sorry. You oh. froze. Isn't something. there? Oh, isn't there a halacha that you can't learn out from Navi a halacha? <clears throat> um, not exactly. Uh, okay. My son mentioned. I'm not a London, but my son mentioned this one. Yeah, so we, we don't learn out we from. Learn, we do learn many things from so the I don't Navi. Know what he meant. Yeah, we do learn a lot of things from Navi. It doesn't. Uh, okay. That's much more complicated, and we don't have time now to get into okay, it. I really right. have to go and, and dub it. It's almost Shabbos where I am. So, you know, um, just let me very quickly look at the questions. Yeah, the scholar is the real Torah. That's why today there's no mitzvah to write the Sefer Torah because we have other books. Uh, Rambam's reasons give an introduction. We learn from the actions of our forefathers. Absolutely. Oh, somebody from Yerushalayim was on today. Very nice. Ramosha Sternbach is the Gadol now in Eretz Yisrael. That's interesting. Because I think he lived in South Africa for a while. Roshmuel Kamenetsky in America. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, discuss how this led the Karaites. Okay. That's a whole lot. We had a series on the Karaites. Um, Daniel Lasker. We have it on, on the Torah Motion Archives. It gave it fascinating. Karaite Halacha. It's really fascinating. I, I didn't become a Karaite. And I, you know, we shouldn't become carrots, but it was really, it, they're not some idiots who just said this. They're, there's a whole philosophy behind charism, and it's very interesting. And they used to be big, very big at one time. Uh, Raleigh Rubin knew all the Bible that you were showing me. How, yeah, Charlie Rubin also knew. You want to say he knew that you were showing me to that? Could be. He, he was a, they, some say he was the greatest Bucky in that generation in terms of knowledge, if you're not, not necessarily an analysis like Rav Soloveitchik, but some say Shaul Lieberman was the greatest Bucky from that whole, you know, the Rav Arnkot, the Rav Shmuel Kamenetsky, Rav Ruderman, that whole generation of Gedolim who came to America, that he was perhaps the greatest Bucky of them all. But uh, anyways, okay, I want to wish everybody a Shabbat Shalom. And uh, from Shabbat Shalom, stay safe. Peace and good news. And uh, people are strong here, but they need to be stronger and more more peaceful. And we should hear good things. And please God, next week we'll be back to our regular time. How much longer are you going to be there? Leaving Sunday morning. So not very long. <laughs> it's a quick visit. Quick visit. And when but did you arrive? Monday night. That's a quick visit. And it's a long flight because there are no direct flights from, from Canada now. You have to fly. So we flew via London. You have to fly either via America because LL stopped flying a few years ago and Air Canada stopped flying with the war. So there are no direct flights from Canada to Israel. So, okay. Anyways. Okay. I want to wish everybody a... Hey, thank a, you. A Be well. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Good. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.